Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's great to see everyone here on this beautiful day after the skies opened last night. We were just talking about that. About 4 o'clock in the morning, I thought God had dropped a nuclear device on our mirror door, but um, we, we made it through the night. So welcome. Glad to see everybody this morning as we continue our lecture series on world religions with a topic that some of you may think you know all about, and that's Christianity. Uh, this was, of all the talks that I have to do, or that I am doing, I don't have to do any of them, <laughs> of the talks that I'm doing, this is perhaps the one that's most difficult for me. And you think, why is that? Because I have two master's degrees in theology. Um, it's because I have, uh, I have almost 300 hours of lectures at, on our website, the Lakeside Institute of Theology, on topics related to Christianity. So for me to do the whole of Christianity in one hour is very difficult. <laughs> It's like picking what you're not going to talk about. So we'll do the best we can today. Um, we have already talked about the universal aspect of religious belief, that we've never had a culture that did not have some sort of belief in the supernatural or supernatural beings, etc. We then, in order of chrono chronology, when they started, Hinduism, Judaism, and then last week we talked about the uh, re religions. Um, I've got one missing. Uh, the... Uh, Buddhism is not in there, but it, anyway, there's one that happened in between those two on the 11th. <laughs> Somehow I deleted it as I was editing this. Um, and then last week we talked about the religions of China and Japan, Taoism, Confucianism, some shamanism, Shinto in, in Japan. Today, Christianity. So we will spend an hour focusing on uh, the religion, which is the largest religion in the world today, Christianity, with approximately 2.2 billion adherents. Um, next week, we will talk about the second largest religion in the world, which is Islam, with about 1.6 billion. And then, the, oops, the October 9th, we will talk about animism, New Age, atheism, secularism. I'll sort of, you know, uh, do a mashup of anything that feel, I feel like it needs to be uh, covered before we finish. So, this chart we've looked at often. Today, Christianity, in terms of chronological order, Hinduism began 2,500 to 4,000 BC, so that's between 4,500 and 6,000 years ago. And then Judaism, around 2,000 BC, 4,000 years ago. Then we jumped ahead by 1,500 years to the Axial Age, where there are a number of major world religions that began within about 100 years of each other, particularly Buddhism, Taoism, um, Shinto, Confucianism, Shamanism in the uh, Far East, Shintoism, and then Jainism uh, around the same time, which is um, actually uh, one of the Indian religions. Today, Christianity, we jump ahead 500 more years. Then next week, we jump ahead quite a bit more than that, um, and pick it up from there. I mentioned to you last week that there are three major families of religions. The Abrahamic religion, which is the one we're returning to today, began with Judaism and then Christianity. Christianity is an offshoot of Judaism, I'm sure you probably know that, and then Islam, which likewise is an offshoot that came out of the basic beliefs of, of uh, Judaism and Christianity, each of those with a slight variation. The Dharmic religions are those that began in India, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, and then the Taoic religions that we talked about last week, especially those in China and Japan, um, the Taoism, Confucianism, Shinto, and I mentioned that sometimes, although they're not considered extant world religions because there are not very many adherents anymore, the pre-Islamic Iranian religions, Zoroastrianism, uh, Mandaism, and the Kurdish uh, Yazdanism faiths, okay, which you heard hear about some today because the Yazidis, for instance, are heavily persecuted by ISIS or ISIL. These are the families of religions. We are now going back to the largest of those. Between them, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, primarily Christianity and Islam, constitute almost or around 60% of the total population of the planet. Um, if you look at a map of the spread of religions, the Abrahamic religions pretty much cover the whole map except for India and China, Korea, Korea Japan. And North Korea is one of, or South Korea, I'm sorry, is one of the most Christian nations in the world. They send missionaries to the United States. When I was working, um, when I was in seminary at Fuller in Pasadena, and uh, we would have visitors from the Asian Center for Theological Studies, or ACTS, in South Korea. We would take them around to different locations. They have huge churches planted by South Korean uh, churches in Southern California, primarily as mission churches, in order to try to bring pagan Americans to the Christian faith. Okay, so, um, interesting. 
We are going back, as I say, to the Abrahamic religions. We go back to Father Abraham, the one who is seen as the founder of all three of the major, major monotheistic religions in the world today, of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All three look to Father Abraham. And we talked about this when we looked at Judaism, the call of Abraham in Genesis 12. And there's an important highlight here. Uh, Genesis 12 says, The Lord said to Abram, Ab at first his name was Abram, and later got changed to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. Up to that point, the focus is on the Hebrew people, the Jewish nation and religion. But then, in the end of verse 3, we get a critical statement. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through it. This is how it is that both Christianity and Islam see themselves as also being descended from Abraham. That he was given the, the, the call and the commission by God to not only create the Jewish faith and the Jewish nation, actually the Jewish nation, the Jewish faith came later with Moses, but that he would be the one through whom God would reach out and touch all peoples of the earth. All right? Because of that, there had always been within Judaism a strong messianic expectation. Now the word Messiah, which you have heard, you all know Handel's Messiah, right? Every Christmas, although the Messiah actually covers the whole of the Christian story, including, including Easter time. It's usually uh, done at Christmas. The Messiah is a Hebrew word which means the anointed one. It is the same word as the Greek word Christ. Messiah in Hebrew, Christ in Greek, both mean anointed. Both of them are uh, words that identify the centuries-long Jewish expectation that God was going to send a representative to finally clean everything up and make it the way he wanted it to be from the start, to fulfill the promise that had been made to Abraham and that had been renewed in Moses and then had been renewed in King David, the three great figures of Judaism, Abraham, Moses, and David. So there is throughout the Old Testament a whole, a long series of messianic uh, prophecies or statements of one who is to come. In Daniel 7, one of my favorite passages in Scripture, people laugh at me because I have a lot of favorites. <laughs> Daniel 7, this is Daniel, has, Daniel has a number of visions. It is a, a, a prophetic, apocalyptic kind of book. He said, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. People comment on the fact that Jesus called himself son of man. That was Jesus' most popular title for himself. Well, son of man does not just mean a human. This is what son of man means, and it's what would have been understood by any Jew who heard him say that. I, there was before me one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, which is my favorite name for God. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into His presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That actually is what Jesus meant when He said that He was the Son of Man. And this is one of the strong Messianic expectations, uh, or uh, verses that give the Messianic expectation. There are other passages that talk about that He will be born of a virgin, that he will be born in Bethlehem. Throughout the Old Testament, from the time, uh, certainly from Moses, some would say that there are passages earlier than that, there are references in the Psalms, there are references in the prophet Malachi, and in Micah, and in other of the prophets, to the one who is to come, who will be the anointed one of God. It was expected after David that he would be an heir to David, that he would be like King David, that he would come and establish God's kingdom rule on earth. Now, for the Jews, that meant putting the Jews in charge, that the Jews would finally get what they thought was their right, and that is that they would be above all other peoples of the earth. Well, that's the expectation that we need to understand that came out of Judaism, the messianic expectation that has always been part of Judaism in, in the last 60 years or so, or the last century, I can say, the messianic expectation has gotten sort of uh, submerged to the Zionistic expectation. You'll notice that passage I gave you a minute ago where God is talking to Abram. He said, you know, I'll, I'll make you a great people. And he promises Abram elsewhere, I will give you a land that you can call your own. 
The Zion, the expectation of the Zionistic promise was the, the promise of the land. And so the idea of the Messiah has been sort of set aside by many Jewish people in favor of, or secondary to, the Zionistic expectation, which in the 1940s, with the creation of the nation of Israel, was seen as beginning to be fulfilled. You can tell there's a lot I could do with this. Okay. <laughs> now, so there's this expectation there. The Jewish people had a historic expectation that God would send a Messiah, His anointed one, that would come and establish the kingdom that God intended to have on earth, which the Jews thought would be primarily their kingdom. <clears throat> it's important, too, to see, because we're now shifting from Judaism to the time when Christianity begins, Palestine, the area in that part of the Middle East that we know of as Israel, and someone recently said to me that, that, that they had listened to a speaker who said there was no such word as Palestine. It was just made up. And, and I'm not quite sure where the speaker had gotten that because there is. Palestine is sort of a twisting of the, of the name Philistine. Remember the Philistines? They're the ones that King David, that, uh, I'm sorry, that Samson did battle with. Actually, David fought them too. The Israelites, they were a, a thorn in the side of the Israelites for centuries. But the Samson is best known for killing, you know, a bazillion of them with the, the jaw of an ass, the jawbone of an ass. So the Philistines lived in the coastal areas. At one point, the whole area started being called Palestine, which was a twisting of the name Philistine. Well, Palestine, in Jesus' time, by the first century, what we know as the first century, was very much the center of the world. It literally was the crossroads for three continents. This is an ancient German map. Not, it's, I don't think it's intended to be a literal map, but it's a metaphorical or a symbolic map, which gives you that idea. You will notice the three lobes. The upper left is Europa. It's Europe. The upper right is Asia. The lower lobe is Africa. And it's hard for you to read from there, but the middle says Jerusalem. It was not only spiritually and sort of um, philo philosophically the center of the universe. Now, there are other places that claim to be the center of the universe. Thebes claims to be the center of the universe. Um, Delphi, there are various other locations. But, in fact, if, if you go to Delphi, you can see this, this article, the stone, which is supposed to be the belly button of the world. Okay, That's what they refer to it as. There's a Greek word for it. Uh, but the idea was that not only spiritually and philosophically was Jerusalem and Palestine seen as the center of the world, but quite literally, if you wanted to go from Europe to Africa, where did you have to go? If, if you're if we're traveling by sea, if you're going by land, you had to go through the Levant, which is one name for the, the land bridge that is modern Israel. If you wanted to go from Africa to Asia, or Asia to Africa. If you wanted to go even from Europe to Asia, you had to go through the northern part of this area. So in a very real way, this was the center of the world. And that geographical location was critically important. In addition to the geography, there are a number of other factors that come into play. Politically and culturally, what we call the first century, the first century A.D., and A.D. stands for uh, Anno Domini, or Year of Our Lord. I told you, I'm sticking with B.C. and A.D. because it just confuses people to use BCE, which means before Common Era, and CE, which is Common Era. If you ever see those, that's because people say we shouldn't have as a reference point Christianity. Well, I'm fine with that, except people just get confused. So I do BC and AD. So the first century AD, the first century of our common time, at Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, after Jesus, AD doesn't mean after death, by the way, it means Anno Domini. But there were a lot of things happening in that first century AD that caused the Christian faith to be able to expand as effectively and as quickly as it did. Particularly, we had the Pax Romana. The Roman Empire controlled all of the Mediterranean Sea by the first century AD. And that meant that the Pax Romana, or the Peace of Rome, the translation from the Latin, was that Rome did not allow bad guys very much latitude. Now, that didn't mean you couldn't get robbed. But traveling by road or by sea during the first century AD was phenomenally safer than it had been a hundred years even before that. Because pirates had been suppressed, highwaymen had been captured, you know, and punished and pretty roughly. And they had also established way stations for the British, for the British, for the Roman army along all of the major Roman roads. So that there were points of security that you could get to, even if there were problems. Secondly, the Roman roads. 
you still, if you go to Italy, if you go to other parts of Europe, if you even go to the Middle East, you can still see the remnants of these huge stone slabs that were the Roman roads. Now granted, they're not that, it's not like asphalt, but compared to trying to climb over, you know, rocks, mountains, the Roman roads were an extraordinary advantage, and so they gave the ability for people to move from place to place much more quickly and easily. And then third, the Greek language, because the, in the several hundred years before Jesus, because Alexander the Great had swept through and, and conquered all of this before the Romans came along, he had gotten everybody speaking Greek. And so no matter where you went, you would run into people who spoke something else. If you went to Thrace, they would speak Thracian. If you went to Macedonia, there was a Macedonian language, but those people all, all spoke Greek too. Throughout the Middle East, they all spoke Greek. You go to Europe, even the Romans, while they spoke Latin as their the administrative language, they would still know Greek as their culture language. They learned it because Greek has real advantages. You know, the Greek is the root language to a lot of what we know today, Latin as well, but Greek is still around. So the Greek language made it possible to talk to almost anybody, because whatever other language they had, they also spoke Greek. So all of these pieces made the first century AD the ideal time for an idea or a new religion to spread. In addition, economically, the first century uh, was a perfect time for a new message of hope. In Israel, for instance, not only were the people required to pay local taxes to the temple, but the Romans taxed them very heavily. You read the Gospels and you get a lot of that. One of the, um, one of the followers of Jesus, one of the apostles, was Matthew, a tax collector. Jesus was accused, one of the accusations against him often was, you eat with sinners and tax collectors, and those things were synonymous. Because the tax collectors were seen as being very oppressive. They basically would collect the taxes from the people and turn over to the Romans what the Romans demanded and keep whatever else it was. So a lot of the tax collectors charged too much so they could get wealthy. Zacchaeus, the story of Zacchaeus, you know, Zacchaeus was a short little man, a short little man was he, you know, so he was a tax collector. You get a lot of those kind of characters. And so this was a time when people felt oppressed economically. They were looking for some sign of hope. And then, morally and religiously, the world was tired and frustrated and ready for a change. The pantheons of the, the, the Greeks and of the Romans, the Romans were very efficient. They just adopted all the Greek gods and gave them Latin names. But they're the same pantheon, basically. Um, you couldn't have a relationship with them. There was no sense in most cases that there was any kind of afterlife or any kind of reward. The best you could do was hope that they didn't decide to pick on you. And in fact, it was the absence of a relational kind of uh, view of the gods that the mystery religions came along, of Mithras and, and uh, Adonis and various others, you know, um, Osiris, other of the various gods from other places. But there was a desire for a change, a looking for a religion that could make a personal difference, that could give you hope, that could give you a sense that there's something beyond just this world, because those other, those polytheistic religions didn't do that. So, um, in fact, that's one of the signs you get in the book of Acts, if you, if you will read about God-fearing Gentiles. God-fearing Gentiles were basically Gentiles who were fed up with the religions that were polytheistic and said, I believe there's got to be just one God out there. And a lot of these God-fearing Gentiles, non-Jewish people, that's what a Gentile is, in case you didn't um, these these non-Jews who had started to believe, I think there must be one God somewhere who's responsible for everything, they would go and listen at the windows of the Jewish synagogue whenever these Jewish rabbis would be teaching or preaching. But most of them would not actually become Jews. Can you imagine why? What was required to become a Jew? You had to have part of yourself cut off. And for most men, especially men with a Greek culture, where the human body was seen as so important, that's why you get all these glorious Greek athletic sculptures, they were willing to do that. So they would listen, but when the opportunity comes along for a religion that's monotheistic, these God-fearing Gentiles who couldn't become a Jew, all of a sudden they didn't have to get circumcised, or, and they could still eat bacon, then that was much more something that they could follow with, and they went along with that. They were anxious for it. So the bottom line is that the history of the early Christian church has Jewish roots. Christianity began as an offshoot of Judaism. Jesus, who is the founder of the, Jew of the Christian faith, was Jewish. 
a lot of Gentile Christians down through the years have forgotten that. All of the first converts to Christianity were Jewish. Now, when you get to Acts 15, there is a special council, the Council of Jerusalem, where they had to deal with the fact that some Gentiles are beginning to accept Jesus. And is that okay? Are they okay the way they are? Or do they have to become Jews first? Do they have to be circumcised? Do they have to, have to promise not to eat shellfish or bacon? You know, and not, you know, not walk more than an eighth of a mile or something on the Sabbath, etc. And they decided no. That the Holy Spirit had demonstrated His presence when some of these Gentiles in Antioch, the first Gentiles, were, were a Roman centurion in his family, Cornelius and his family, and they became Christians, and the Holy Spirit became evident on them, and so the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15 said, no, God has said these people are okay the way they are. They don't have to become Jews. And that opened the gates for Gentiles to become part of this Christian faith. But it is in fulfillment of the Jewish expectation that God would send a Messiah, a Christ, an anointed one, to bring freedom to the Jews and to establish the kingdom of God on earth, which is the Jewish expectation. Now the Jews thought that meant that was elevation of Israel, the Jewish people and the nation of Israel, both religiously and politically, in the same way that it had occurred under King David. And that they would have a ruler who ruled them, but also ruled everybody else, and that ruler would be like King David. King David, one of the three great figures of Jewish, Jewish history, was the political ruler. He also was de facto the head of the religious beliefs. Now there were prophets, Prophet Samuel especially, and there were priests. But David was seen as the one who really was the primary representative that God had put in place, not only politically, but religiously. And so the Jews expected that would happen again. So here you have Abraham as the founder. You will remember the first child Abraham had was by Sarah's handmaid, Hagar. Hagar. That was Ishmael. Ishmael became the father of 12 tribes, and those 12 tribes became the parent, the, the, the source of the Arabic peoples. Arabs and Jews are cousins. A lot of people don't get that either. They come from the same root stock. Then, later, Sarah, Abraham's proper legal wife, had a son, the promised son, Isaac. Isaac had uh, Jacob, or Israel, along with Esau. And Jacob then had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. Though That's the Jewish line. From the 12 tribes of Israel, Jesus, down the line, comes along. Now we're talking 1,800 years later, Jesus comes along. But he's descended from the line of Judah. Judah was the oldest of his, Jacob's <coughs> sons. I say Jacob Israel because Jacob had his, um, his name changed as well. Major things happened in people's lives spiritually. They got their names changed. So, Jesus is a descendant from the 12 tribes of Israel. And by the way, that same chart we're going to look at when we talk about Islam, because the same, on the left-hand side, you'll see a dotted line that leads to Muhammad, who is seen as a descendant through, from Abraham, through Hagar, Ishmael, the 12 tribes of Ishmael, and on down, in the same way Jesus was from the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? So, 2,000 years ago, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, and remember those words mean the same thing, they mean the Anointed One. In the Old Testament... Whenever someone was set aside by God, they were anointed, quite literally. Samuel, the prophet, was sent to find David to anoint him with oil as a sign that he had been selected by God to be the king later on. He was still just a boy at that time. So the anointing was a process in the Old Testament, usually quite literally, the anointing with oil. But it was a sign that a person, or sometimes a thing, the material, the, the, the furniture in the tabernacle and later in the temple was all um, anointed, made sacred, set aside for a special purpose. But when we use the word in terms of a person, it means selected by God for a special purpose and usually quite literally anointed with oil. Right? So the Christ, the Messiah, the dates that we have, and you notice this says circa. Jesus was not born on zero. The, the people who came up with the dates as to when Jesus was born, etc., they got it wrong somewhere between four and six years, we're pretty sure. So Jesus was probably born sometime between four and six BC and lived until sometime around 27 AD. We don't have exact dates on that. And people say, well, why do we know this stuff? How could they forget something like that? Well, the Jewish mindset was very different than our Western mindset. They didn't keep track of birthdays the way we do. 
Jesus almost certainly was not born on December 25th. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. But when it says that the, the shepherds were you know, keeping their flocks in the fields by night, shepherds in, the, in that part of the world never kept their flocks out at night in December. It was too cold. And it was a danger to the flocks. It was almost certainly sometimes spring to fall. And yet, the reason why we do it on December 25th is because under Pope Gregory, Pope Gregory had the grand idea, and I think it's a great idea, I'm, I'm, I'm not being facetious, to take the pagan holidays and baptize them, if you will, and make them Christian holidays. And that could be one way. And it, it, he, he was smart enough to know if you just take all these celebrations away from the pagans and don't give them something in their place, they're not going to like it very much. So instead, let's turn the pagan holidays, and so you get celebrations like the winter solstice, it's turned into a major celebration. They didn't know when Jesus was born, so let's put his birthday on December 25th. Okay, close enough to the winter solstice that we'll have a big celebration again. And remember that the celebrations back then weren't just one day, you know, they would celebrate over time, so it did encompass the winter solstice. <coughs> Too many ideas. <laughs> Now, Jesus, when he comes along, he does look like, at first, the Messiah that the Jews were expecting. He was a Jew, he was a descendant of David, the great king, and they, they were, the Jews expected him to be a descendant of David. He met all the other prophetic requirements. They're going down the line, born in Bethlehem, check, born of a virgin, check, you know, etc. That looked good. He observed the Jewish law and traditions, mostly. Right? He had some exceptions, and I'll mention that in a second. He frequently quoted the Law and the Prophets. He was an expert on the Jewish Law and the writings of the Jewish Prophets. In fact, every book of the Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament. Okay? The, you could, in fact, they've often said if we did not have, and, and then those books are also quoted in the writings of the early Church Fathers, we could practically reconstruct the Old Testament based on the New Testament, and we could certainly reconstruct the Old Testament and the New Testament based upon all the writing that was done in the first centuries after Jesus' death, because they quote them at length. That's one of the things that we have as sort of an understanding as are our translations correct today, and we believe they are, to minuscule possible variant and none theologically significant. Jesus spoke in the synagogues where the Jews gathered. He was clear that his ministry was first to the Jews, and then to the Gentiles. In one place, a, a woman, when Jesus is traveling up north along the coast, the, the Tyre and Sidon, a Gentile woman comes to him and says, my daughter is very sick, would you heal her? And Jesus says something that if you read it in some translations will really shock you. He says, you know, I'm, my first job is to feed the children before I worry about the dogs. Well, the word he uses for dog is, is a, a sweet word. It sort of means puppy. You know, it's a family pet. But what he was saying was, my first responsibility is to the Jewish people. Well, the woman, very smart, most of the really smart people in the, in the Bible are women, um, really smart, she says, but even the dogs get to collect the scraps under the table. And he goes, girl, you're smart. For that answer, because of that answer and your faith, your daughter is healed. And she was, right then. But this was one of the places where Jesus makes it clear that his first call was to the Jewish people. Now that his intention all along was to bless everybody, but first the Jews. And then through the Jews, as with the promise to Abraham, all the rest of the world. Jesus performed miracles. He was clearly gifted by God as a leader and a teacher. He demonstrated his power as being more than just a person by doing miraculous things and having that attested to. And he had events in his life, most particularly, for instance, the Transfiguration in Matthew 17, which is where he goes up on the mountainside, and some of his followers were there with him, and he, he appears in the presence of both Moses and Elijah, two of the great leaders of the Old Testament. And so he had these miraculous kind of events that attested to the fact that he was something more than just, you know, another Joe. But there were some problems from the Jewish point of view. Jesus was not a political leader like King David. They thought he was going to come in, and you read this in the Gospels. Everybody keeps saying, when are you going to throw the Romans out? When are you going to get rid of the oppression? When are you going to get rid of the Romans? And Jesus kept saying, that's not why I'm here. I come to give you freedom, but not freedom like you think of freedom. Not political freedom, but rather spiritual freedom. Then he also did not speak the way, and it says this in several places, he did not talk the way other people talk. 
Every other religious leader in the Jewish faith would always have to quote somebody else. They would never assume that they were speaking on their own authority. They would either <coughs> quote the prophets or Moses, or they would quote, quote some great leader before them. They would say, as the great teacher Hillel had said, and they would quote them. Jesus didn't do any of that. He said, I say unto you. In fact, often he would say, you have heard it said, such and such and such, but I say to you, and he would give a different interpretation. They never heard anybody talk like that, and it made them nervous. He claimed to be the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. The first time he goes back to, to his hometown, he gets up and he reads from the scrolls, and then he sits down to teach, as they always did back then. And the, you know, the, the statement was a messianic statement, and he sits down and says, Today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And they all went, What? He broke some of the rules, especially rules like healing on the Sabbath or letting his worker, his uh, friends eat on the Sabbath. That's, he, that's one of the big ones because he said the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The original plan for the Sabbath as part of the Ten Commandments, you know, respect the Sabbath, the seventh day, keep it holy, on this day you will do no work, you know, etc. That was supposed to be a gift to human beings. For the first time, somebody was saying, you don't have to work 16 hours a day, seven days a week. There is one day a week that you not only can rest, but you need to rest. It was intended to be a blessing, and instead, the Pharisees and other religious legalists in the Jewish faith had turned it into this a burden, this oppression. Oh, no, you broke the rule. I saw you scratch your nose. You know, you walked too far. And then they were always coming up with some sort of ways around it. Have you ever heard of a roof wire? Because it said you could not, you know, you were only allowed, women were only allowed to carry their babies inside their own homes. Well, what if you needed to go to the store and it was just across the, you know, across the square? Well, an Aruv wire is a wire that the Jews would mount around a perimeter and then declare that all of this was part of their house. And so they could walk to the store as long as it was within the boundaries of that Aruv wire carrying their baby, or they could do anything else without that being a violation. I only give that as an example of how far they were going to try to, you know, come up with these exceptions for the Sabbath rulings or for others. And Jesus said, you guys are getting it all wrong. The Sabbath especially is supposed to be a gift, not a curse. He hung around with a bad crowd. Jesus said, I didn't come for those who are well. I came for the sick. I came for the sinner, especially tax collectors and sinners. This is one of the things he was most criticized for, is you don't hang around with the right people. I actually once went to a Bible study being led by a college student. It's right after I was out of college and had gone back to visit. And this young man, very well intentioned, he read a passage where Jesus was criticized for eating with sinners and tax collectors. And after reading the passage, the young man did a Bible study, and the point of his Bible study was to say, see, this is how careful we need to be. Even Jesus didn't get it that he shouldn't hang around with that. <laughs> <laughs> Not. Okay. Um, he openly criticized the Jewish leaders. He called them whitewashed sepulchers, for instance. Sepulchers are tomb. And worst of all, he claimed to be the Son of God. If you've ever had a teacher or anybody else tell you that Jesus never really claimed to be the Son of God, he claimed to be the Son of Man. I just read you what Son of Man meant. Eternal dominion. And he did call himself the Son of God. He allowed the people around him to worship him. When they called him the Son of God, he never corrected them. When the high priest said, ask him the question, because they know Jesus had said that, said, are you the Son of God? And Jesus said, it is as you say. Which was a polite way of saying, yes. And we know that that's what it understood because the high priest tears his robes, which was the sign that the only time he would do that is in the case of blasphemy. There was no question what Jesus was claiming about himself. And so because of all these kind of things, the Jewish authorities rejected him. Still today, there are Jews who are becoming Christians because they, they have become awakened to the fact that Jesus really is the fulfillment of the Jewish expectation for the Messiah. That he really does fulfill all the Old Testament expectations. I've done work with some of the Messianic organizations like Jews for Jesus. Their whole message is, Jesus is the one that Jews have been waiting for. And he's already been here once. And we missed him. You know, so many Jews just didn't get it. He's coming again. Let's, let's accept him and get ready for him. All right? Now, in terms of the early Christian church, a little more history, and then I'll get into beliefs. 
we believe around circa 4 or 6 BC, Jesus was born in the city of Bethlehem, south of, of uh, Jerusalem. During the time of 26 to 36 AD, Pontius Pilate was the procurator or the sort of Roman governor of the area of Palestine. You notice there's no circa on that because we know exactly when he was the governor. For a long time, because we didn't have records that Pontius Pilate was, was a real historical figure, some critics say, that's just made up. Then they found <coughs> stones with his name and title carved on them. Archaeologically, they dug them up, so now they accept that. In around 26 uh, or 27, or around 26, Jesus is baptized, he begins his public ministry. Somewhere between 27 and 30, he is crucified, resurrected, and ascended. And again, the tradition is that Jesus uh, began his ministry at 30, and he, he ministered for three years. We don't know that for sure, depending upon whether you're looking at John or the other Gospels, which, which take a different approach. Like two people seeing a scene from opposite sides, they, they are seeing the same thing. They're not describing anything contradictory, but it's hard sometimes to understand how the details are described in the Gospels. Um, sometime 27 to 30, he's crucified um, and dies, is resurrected, according to the Christian faith, and is ascended. I'm, I'm not going to keep qualifying these things in terms of, well, this is what's believed. This is Christianity, and so it is believed he died was resurrected, came back from the dead, and ascended. And then, around 30, shortly after his ascension, meaning he went back into the heavens, the Holy Spirit is given to the Christians at Pentecost to reside with them forever. Um, the church begins to grow, and there is Jewish persecution. Stephen, who was one of the early deacons of the church, the elders of the church, the, the apostles, that is, um, they reached the point as they were growing, people had needs, and they, they said, we can't take time away from teaching and, you know, the, the sacraments, etc., to wait on tables, quite literally. You know, Peter says to wait on tables, and so they, they elected deacons to care for the service needs. One of them is Stephen. Stephen becomes the first Christian martyr, and the Christian diaspora starts. Diaspora means the spreading out, you know, the, the running out, and that's by God's providence. The Christian diaspora, because of persecution, the Christians in Jerusalem left and spread out, and in doing so, they carried the message. It's also true at Pentecost, which I mentioned here. Jews from all over the Eastern Mediterranean, from as far away as Rome, from Libya in North Africa, from parts of Persia, all of them had come to Jerusalem for the major festival of Pentecost. Pentecost was the celebration of the Jewish faith, uh, the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. And so it was a major festival. While the Jews had come from Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls on the Christians who are gathered secretly, they become emboldened. Peter preaches this great sermon, and 3,000 become converted immediately. Later on, that number grew to 5,000. Well, those people who were from all over, they're Jews who now believe that Jesus was the Messiah they've been waiting for, they all went home. And for instance, that very early there was a church in Rome. Before Paul ever wrote the Rome letter to Romans or anybody else went there that we know of, we think it's because all of these Jews who had become believers had gone back to their locations. And so, it spread. In 34, Saul, again, he had a name first, Saul. Uh, he was a persecutor of Christians. He's on his way to Damascus, a major city in Syria, to persecute these Jews who had run out of Jerusalem, who had fled in the diaspora. And he has a vision on the road to Damascus. He's knocked down. He hears the voice of Jesus saying, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? He becomes a convert. Later, his name is changed to, to Paul. And then, eight years later, oops, he begins his missionary journeys. 49 and 50 is when we believe the Council of Jerusalem welcomes Gentiles, and so the church is officially open to non-Jewish believers. 54 to 60 is during the time of Emperor Nero, the first great Roman persecution. Now, the first persecution was limited only to the city of Rome. Uh, Nero was looking for somebody to blame to get the heat off himself about burning down Rome. There's no real evidence that he actually had burned Rome, but everybody kept blaming him. And so he's, he was looking for somebody to blame it on, and he picked the Christians. So the early persecution, this led to Peter being martyred, we believe, around 62 in Rome, and Paul being martyred in Rome sometime between 62 and 68. So that's the early church history. Now, by A.D. 70, this is within about 40 years of Jesus' death, this is the extent of the Christian faith. Now, it's not, it's, it is covered all. Uh, this is what we call Turkey. Asia Minor, the Black Sea up here. Um, this is what we know of as Greece. Obviously over here is Italy. That's the area around Rome. This is Palestine, North Africa. This is within 40 years. 
without email or telephone or planes or trains or automobiles. Now, a significant reason why it grew this much in that period of time is this guy, the Apostle Paul. Paul had four missionary journeys. I'm going to break this down for you. He was the primary evangelist to the Gentiles. Again, Jews were spread out everywhere in small bodies. And wherever Paul went, he first looked for the synagogue or for the Jewish gatherings. But then he became very much the missionary to the Gentiles. He calls himself that. Peter was focused more on the Jews, Paul more on the Gentiles. Well, his missionary journeys, this is the first two. The first, now, his base of operations was in Antioch, Antioch of Syria, as opposed to Antioch of Galatia up here. Okay? Antioch of Syria was one of the four largest cities in the Roman Empire. After Rome, Constantinople, Alexandria, and then Antioch. All right, so it was a major center. That's where Paul was. That's where Barnabas was. Paul and Barnabas did their first missionary journey. It's the one in black. To the island of Cyprus and then up into the churches of Galatia. If you read the book of Galatians in the New Testament, that is written back to those churches that Paul and Barnabas planted in that area. And some of you say, wait a minute, Galatians further up north, there's a theory about that. I don't think that theory is right. I can't talk about everything, so we're not going to get into it. The second uh, trip that he took with Silas, a different partner, he went overland from Antioch. Whoa, 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 wrong button. Overland from Antioch and visited and traveled through Asia Minor, spent time in Ephesus, another major city in the Roman Empire. And if you ever have a chance to go to Ephesus, take it. It's one of the most extraordinary sites and ruins in the world. We've been there a couple times, I look forward to going back. And then he crossed over by sea into Europe. This is Asia. This is Europe. And he visited Philippi, several other cities, Thessalonica, down to Athens, and then to Corinth. If you know your New Testament, you'll know the names Philippians, the Thessalonians, the, uh, the Corinthian. Those are all letters that he wrote to the churches that he planted there. He then had two more. Whoops. Okay, this is his third and fourth. His second, you know, he goes over to these areas and then comes back. The third, he travels overland, visits some of the same places, the, and then he comes back to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, he's arrested because the Jews create a riot, thinking that he has defiled the temple by bringing non-Jews in. He's arrested. He spends two years at Caesarea, which is on the coast right here. Caesarea was the Roman center. Two years he's there probably while the guy who was in charge at that time was waiting for him to pay a bribe to get loose and he wouldn't do it. He then gets taken to Rome. And all the way along in the book of Acts tells the story, he ends up in Rome. When he is in Rome and under house arrest, the book of Acts ends. And officially that's the last we hear about Paul, but there are very strong traditions that Paul ended up being released during that first, from that first imprisonment in Rome and traveled to, all the way to Spain. In fact, there's some traditions that he went all the way to Britain, which also was Roman. All of this was part of the Roman Empire. But there are very strong traditions he went to Spain, and we know from references in his own letters that Paul was intending. He wanted to go to Spain. So maybe he did. There may have been a fifth missionary journey of Paul. From that, he comes back to this part of the world, is arrested again, and ends up being martyred by a beheading in Rome. Now, Peter was crucified because he was a Jew. And tradition is that he didn't want to be crucified the way Jesus had been because he didn't feel worthy to do that. So Peter, traditionally, was crucified upside down. Paul was a Roman citizen. And that comes out a lot in the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is the history of the church, the early church. And so because he was a Roman citizen, he was beheaded. He didn't have to go through the, the torment of being crucified. So in the first and second century, this is what the map of the spread of Christianity looks like. I gave you AD 70 before. All of this green part over in all of southern um, Italy, uh, the Sicily, all of southern Greece, Asia Minor, the Middle East, North Africa, all of this by the end of the first century. That's 100. <coughs> Christianity had a strong presence. Doesn't mean it was the dominant faith, but it had a strong presence. There were churches established there. By the second century, all of this brown area, all the way up into almost the, you know, the into France, Germany, uh, the southern part of Spain, other parts of North Africa, all the way up into what we know of as Iraq and Iran by 200. Again, remember, no phone, no email, no plane, no train, no car, and yet it spread. And it did not spread because they had an army, unlike 
the spread of Islam, which we'll talk about next week, which was spread as they conquered. There was no political conquering here. It grew because people heard this and believed it and accepted it. By the year 565, which is important, we'll talk about that in Islam next week, you'll see this map again, you will notice that the green line is the Roman Empire. Anything inside that is the Roman Empire under Theodosius, one of the great, uh, I'm sorry, under Justinian, one of the great, uh, the guy who almost succeeded in bringing the Roman Empire back. He was, he was uh, in Constantinople, which had become the center of the Roman Empire at that point, not Rome. And so um, that was the center. But look how far Christianity has spread, all of the brown sections, well outside the range of the Roman Empire. Now, the reason for that is that throughout the first 300 years, Christianity suffered various persecutions, some of them significant persecutions under Roman emperors. Um, the worst of the persecutions under Diocletian, under Galerius, uh, Decius, Valerian, others, were quite horrible, and they were throughout the whole Roman Empire. But in the early 300s, Constantine, and I could give you a history of the Roman Empire, it's fascinating stuff, but Constantine, whose father, uh, Constantius, had been one of the junior emperors. Constantine, in the early 300s, takes over the Roman Empire, and before he wins a critical battle, the Battle of the Melvian Bridge, he has a vision of a Christian symbol, the symbol we know as the Chi Rho, the thing that looks like a P with an X over it. Those are Greek letters, Chi Rho. Those are the first two letters in the word Christ in Greek. And so, Chi Rho, that symbol, in a vision or a dream, Constantine saw this, and he had his thesaurus, he had all of his soldiers paint that on their shields, and he won a very unlikely battle at Milvian Bridge and defeated his great, greatest opponent. So in 313, he arranges the, um, to make Christianity legal. Technically, it had been illegal before that, before 313. But the Edict of Milan gave Christians the right to worship, and then in 324, Constantine takes over the empire, and he makes Christianity the favored religion, not the formal religion. There were still other religions. But then 324, Constantine makes it not only okay, but probably better for people if they were Christian. In 361, we get two years of weirdness, because an emperor named Julian, who is known in history as Julian the Apostate, tries to suppress Christianity and bring back the pagan religions. He, he liked the old gods. He only lived two years as emperor, and then when he died, in 380, the emperor Theodosius comes along and he makes Christianity the legal, formal religion of the Roman Empire. So that's very quick history. Um, there, are, there are, by the way, uh, online, as I say, almost 300 hours of lecture of church history. We have two courses that the videos are available free of charge. You can review that stuff. Um, I recommend some books in that regard that are really, really good reads. They're really fun to read. And so there's some fascinating history involved in all of that, um, as well as all the classes on Bible and all the other things. And, and starting next Thursday, we start the ninth term of our Lakeside Institute of Theology. We will have courses Thursday morning. We'll have a course on Christian ethics from 10 to 12. We'll be right back there. Thursday afternoon, starting next Thursday, we will have a class on worship from 1 to 3. This is Christian worship. And then on Fridays from 1 to 3, we will have a class on apologetics 2, responding to the new atheists. And I'll talk about atheism a little bit in two weeks. All right. The Christian faith is based upon, and, and that, those are free of charge. Anybody can come to those. Okay? They're just like this. We will have texts. If you want to buy the books, they will be available, but you can come to the lectures free of charge. The document, the source document for Christianity is the Bible. The Bible is in two parts. I, I know, I figure most of you know this, but the Old Testament and the New Testament. Testament, the word really means covenant. So it was the, God's old way of working with his people, the Jews, and the new plan, the new. It's not that it's inconsistent, it's the development of it, the extension of it. The new covenant, the New Testament. Now the Old Testament is the Hebrew Bible. The Tanakh, as it's called, as I talked about when we talked about Judaism. Now, the Hebrew Bible has 24 books. The Christian New Te Old Testament has 39 uh, books. It's not, but it's exactly the same material. It's in slightly different order, and we break it up differently. The Christian Old Testament has 1st and 2nd Chronicles, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Samuel. Those are, each of those is one book. We have 12, the 12 prophets are separate in the, the Christian Old Testament. They're one book in the Hebrew Bible. 
And then the New Testament, which is the first four books of the stories of Jesus, the Gospel. The next book, the book of Acts, is the story, the history of the early church. And then the writings of Paul, Paul's, Paul's books, and then some of the other leaders, James and Peter, etc. Um, if you get the Catholic Church has, um, actually has seven more books because they add what is called the Apocrypha, um, which I'm not going to get into. And the Orthodox Church actually has 51. They add more books than that. These are books that are intertestamental. They come between what the Protestants have as the Old Testament and the New Testament. They were the period in between. All right? All the stories I could tell. All right. How we got the New Testament very quickly. And I'm, I'm doing this as important because as a Christian, as a Christian minister, this is important to me. But I think it's important for us to know when we say the Bible, people go, the Bible. Everybody knows that that was written hundreds and hundreds of years after Jesus. That, that it, you know, that it's not true. Archaeologically, we've proven that stuff is all wrong. Speaking personally, let me just say those are lies. The best scholarship available today from the best scholars available today don't agree with those interpretations. More and more and more people, even if they don't profess to be Christian, are beginning to say that the traditional views are solid. There are more than 5,800 surviving Greek manuscripts and fragments of Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. That is, by a factor of 10, more than any other ancient document. In addition to the Greek manuscripts, because the New Testament is written in Greek, we have books in Syriac and a lot of other ancient languages that are comparable from the same time period. The oldest extant portion of, uh, that we have, meaning the oldest existing original portion, is of the Gospel of John, written in AD 125. Of course, most of the stuff was written, all ancient books were written on very uh, volatile material, stuff that, you know, like parchment or uh, papyrus that decayed and, and went away. And that's why it had to be recopied. That's why we don't have the original. But compared to the New Testament, the closest thing we have in terms of reliability of the original documents would be um, the writings of Homer, the Iliad. And we have 647 manuscripts of that book, only 190 complete copies, and the closest one is not from 125, which we believe is probably about 35 years after, after John wrote the Gospel, but rather is like 900 years later. Um, all New Testament books were written in the first century. More and more and more scholars are agreeing with that, which is the traditional view. That the last of the New Testament books written was the Revelation of St. John, the book of Revelation, which we believe was written somewhere in the, the 90s, 95. John was the last of the apostles to live, the only one to die a natural death. All the others were martyred. The earliest of the New Testament books is probably the letter to the Galatians, which is A.D. 51, or perhaps even slightly earlier. The book of James, some people would say maybe even earlier than that, which would be pre-A.D. 50. The earliest gospel, the book of Mark, was written in the 50s or 60s. So we're talking within 20 years or so of Jesus' death. And that all of the gospels were written sometime, and that rather than say they were all written by somebody else, more and more scholars, as I believe, and I've studied this stuff pretty hard, and I've read the people who disagree with this and the people who agree with it, I believe that they were written by the people that are attested to have written them. That Matthew was written by the Apostle Matthew. Mark was written by John Mark, who accompanied Paul on that first, at least part of the first missionary journey, and later became the assistant and secretary for Peter. And so the Gospel of Mark is very much the Gospel according to Peter. That John wrote the Gospel of John, for instance, um, that Luke, the companion of Paul, who was a physician, traveled with Paul, and in the process met all of these guys, including the Virgin Mary. You read things like, you know, Mary heard this and she treasured up these thoughts in her heart. Well, how do we know that? Well, because Luke tells us that he interviewed all of these people during the time, the two years, that Paul was in prison in Caesarea. Luke is in Jerusalem talking to all these people, and Mary was still there. So he heard this from her, we believe. The four Gospels were established as authoritative by A.D. 180. If you have read Dan Brown's books, The Da Vinci Code, that's not history. It's wrong. It is completely wrong, no matter what he says about it. By not, you know, Dan Brown, in case you don't know, says that the books that were in the New Testament were selected by Constantine in order to try to create a political, you know, peace. To settle everybody down, and this happened in the 300s. By AD 180, we have proof 
that from Irenaeus, the, the Bishop of Lyon, in <coughs> one of his friends, listed the four Gospels as being the authoritative Gospels. By AD 190, we had the Moratorian Canon, which was a list of the acceptable writings, which is all of our New Testament, with the, with the exclusion of uh, the revelation of Peter, and the, well, it did include the revelation of Peter and the wisdom of Solomon, who later they decided didn't fit. The earliest listing of the 27 books we have exactly the way we have, although it was 95% complete a long time before that, is in 367, and then later confirmed, oops, sorry, by the councils in Rome in 382 and Carthage in 397. It wasn't even at Nicaea, the Council of Nicaea, that this was all decided. So, I think Dan Brown's books are a really fun sort of guilty pleasure, but they're not true! <laughs> Have I made that point strongly enough? <laughs> the basic Christian beliefs. One, there is a belief that there is one God who reveals himself in three persons, called the Holy Trinity, or the Godhead. Father, Son, who is Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit. They are a unity sharing one substance. This is the thing that Jews and Muslims have the biggest problem with Christianity over. And you say, how can there be one God and yet three persons? Isn't that three gods? Well, there are a lot of analogies that have been used over the years. One of the best ones is an egg. One egg has three parts. It has a shell, it has a white, it has a yolk. It's one egg. But you can separate those parts. Each one of those three parts has a different purpose. But it's one egg. The best analogy for me that, I, that, that came to me a long time ago uh, that I use in teaching is the, the three persons in one, the best analogy is me or you. Think about it. I have a controlling mind, the part that makes the decisions and sort of decides. I have a physical body. And I have a spirit, if you will, the part of me that responds to things that are not cognitive. Love, joy, trust, loyalty, honor, those are not cognitive things. Those are not things just that my brain processes. <coughs> There's a part of me that responds to those things. The controlling force, the physical presence, the spirit that responds to the non-cognitive things. I'm three, three persons in one, if you will. And I think that's a good way for us to understand how God is one God, but he has three elements or persons, three aspects. Second, we believe, Christianity believes God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and omnipresent, meaning present everywhere. He created the world as distinct from himself. This is why it's different than pantheism or panentheism, some of the Asian religions. They say that everything is God, or everything plus a little more is God. That's pantheism and panentheism. Christianity, like Judaism, says God is separate from his creation. He made it, but he is not it. And yet he is active within it as creator, sustainer, and sanctifier. Meaning he makes it holy. Third, Jesus was and is the promised Messiah, the co-eternal divine Son of God. Co-eternal means he has always existed, even before he was born 2,000 years ago. Born, he was born as a human, but he's always existed as the second person of Trinity. Who became a human man, Jesus, but was fully God and fully man. This is, this is one of the mysteries of the Christian faith. So you have to be very secure to admit that there are mysteries. That's one of the problems when we talk about the new atheism. They're not willing to admit that they can't understand everything. This is one of the paradoxes. A paradox is not a contradiction. A contradiction is where two things can't both be true. A paradox is where two things appear to be true, and yet we don't understand how they can both be true. He was fully God, fully man, not 80-20, 100-100. That is our faith. And no one can earn God's mercy or be righteous in his own eyes, but one can only receive forgiveness and mercy by accepting Jesus as God's Son who sacrificed himself on the cross to atone for human sins. In one sentence, human beings were made for a relationship with God, and that is why so many, so many of us are so unsettled, why we have this itch we can't scratch, why we have this desire that we can't satisfy no matter how much stuff we buy. And yet, because we were made for a relationship with God, that relationship was broken, which is why we feel unsettled. We are not capable of ourselves to make that relationship right. We are not strong enough to climb up to God, so to speak. And so God, in his love for us, comes down to us. Jesus, who is fully God and fully human, becomes the bridge that allows the relationship between humanity, who is fallen and unable to, you know, we're fallen and we can't get up, allows human beings to become, come in relationship with God again. That is the Christian doctrine. I'm not trying to evangelize you. I'll be happy to talk to you afterwards if you want to, but the, I'm telling you that because that is the Christian faith. And that's what Jesus is all about. 
I just listened to uh, an, a debate that included Christopher Hitchens. Christopher Hitchens is one of the new atheists. He's one of the four that are called the four, you know, the four horsemen of the non-apocalypse. One of the four. And he died a few years ago, um, cancer. But in it, he said he considered it immoral to think that a, an itinerant preacher 2,000 years ago was tormented and sacrificed for my benefit. He said, or for your benefit, or for anybody's benefit. He said, that's immoral. The idea that another person would be tortured and killed so we can be okay, that's immoral. And you know what? He would be right. Except he has a fundamental misunderstanding of what Christianity says. And that is not that just a man, but that God willingly, rather than punish us, God took upon himself in the person of Jesus, fully God and fully man, took upon himself the punishment in our place. And so that's the difference. Hitchens, his definition of Christianity was wrong. His theology was bad. If it, it, I would agree with him that if we just picked an itinerant preacher 2,000 years ago and tortured him to death for our benefit, that would be immoral. But if God willingly did it to himself because he values us that much, that's a very different story. Today, Christianity exists, Roman Catholicism, I mean, it used to all be one, but today there are three aspects. Roman Catholicism in Rome is the center. Why Rome? Originally, there were five major centers of the Christian faith. There was um, Constant, well, first Jerusalem, then Antioch, which I just mentioned to you, which is one of the four biggest cities of the Roman Empire, Alexandria in, um, in Egypt, because it was a center of great learning, the Library of Alexandria and all that, Constantinople, what we call Istanbul today, had been called Byzantium earlier, and Rome. Well, what's happened to those cities? Jerusalem is sort of a divided city. Primarily, the majority of the population is either Muslim or it's Jewish. Antioch, Alexandria, and Constantinople all fell to the Islamic armies and are now within Muslim parts of the world. <clears throat> the only one that was left of the original five that was kind of independent was Rome. And so the Bishop of Rome, that technically is the title of the Pope, he's the Bishop of Rome. There is no higher position in, Rome, in the Roman Catholic Church than Bishop. Some bishops have special responsibilities, they're called cardinals. The Bishop of Rome happens to be the Pope. So that's why Roman Catholicism and why Rome is the center. For a long time, the center of the Catholic Church was Constantinople. They moved it there. And then after Constantinople was, was taken over by, you know, in the 15th century, then it moved back to Rome. In 1054, there was the Great Schism, in which the, the, at that time, there were really two halves of Christianity. In the West, centered in Rome, they spoke Latin. They had their own rights. You know, they, they, it was very Roman Latin, right? In the East, centered in Constantinople, they spoke Greek. They had a very different understanding of it. The, uh, ortho, the ministers, the priests in the Greek part of the world could marry. The Roman church had said they couldn't marry if you were in Europe. They had a different understanding of communion. They made a big deal of the fact that whether you used <coughs> leavened bread or unleavened bread, et cetera, et cetera. Well, finally in 1054, it all added up to the Great Schism, and they split and created, you know, they, they kept Catholicism centered in Rome, which is Europe, and, and using the Latin rite. But in the East, they created what we know as Orthodoxy. There is Eastern Orthodoxy, there's also Oriental Orthodoxy, or many, or, there's small fragments of that, you know, Eastern Catholic Orthodoxy, various other things. But those were the two, the first big split was in the 11th century, in 1054. And then, in the 16th century, the 1500s, we had a split within the Roman Catholic Church, which is the Protestant Reformation, starting with Martin Luther, little Marty. Um, it's funny, I had a Catholic friend who grew, who was attending a, a Presbyterian church that I was teaching in, and she came up to me one day after class, and she said, I grew up a Catholic. Martin Luther was always a bad guy, and now you guys talk about him like as a hero. It's very weird. So Luther, and then Zwingli in Switzerland, and later on Calvin uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, created the Protestant Reformation. And Luther did not want to split off the Catholic Church. He just wanted the Catholic Church to clean up its act, to stop doing so many things that they were doing wrong. And most of which the Catholic Church has since agreed with wrong. But they wouldn't change. They, in fact, instead anathematized him and threatened to kill him. They were going to burn him at the stake. And he ran off. But the, so the Protestant Reformation happened because the Catholic Church would not respond to the admonitions that they, they do things differently. 
and the Protestants today are Lutheran, Reformed, Anglican, Anabaptist, and the things that fall out of that. You cannot read this chart, but if you want to come out and look at it later, those four big movements, Lutheran, Reformed, Anglican, and Anabaptist, became the roots, you know, those four at the bottom, became the roots of all the Protestant churches that you know about. And you might be surprised. Baptists, for instance, don't come out of Anabaptists. The Mennonites, the brethren, come out of Anabaptists. The Baptists came out of the Anglicans, as did the Methodists. So, if you want to look at that chart, you can. I've gone over five minutes, but trust me, it's hard enough to do anything. <laughs> questions? Any questions I can answer for you? Yes? That uh, first map you showed, the three pedal. Right. Do you have a date on that? I don't. It's ancient, it's ancient German. It's actually pre-Luther, so it's pre-Reformation, because the German that's used on it is before Luther, but there was no date given. So... And it's obviously it's not intended to be a real map. It's just yeah. trying to get a metaphorical sense of, of how central Jerusalem was to, to the whole world. Yes? I have heard that there is no true evidence that Peter was ever in Rome. Now, is that some, just someone's opinion, or do you know more about that? Well, I'm not aware that there's any... I'm not aware of any archaeological evidence. Again, there's two kinds of history. And it's important for us to understand that. There is written history, which is what we almost always think of as history, and then there's archaeological history. Well, we haven't found any archaeological history. In terms of writing, there is a lot of writing of the early church fathers. That is, people who lived, some of them in the first century, um, many of them in the second century. There's several categories. The, the Nicene fathers, the anti-Nicene anti fathers who came first, the Nicene fathers, etc. The, the, and various writers during that time or immediately after that. In other words, at a time when they would still have been able to talk to people who were alive then, or talk to people who talked to people who were alive then. We have many accounts of the fact that Peter was in Rome and that he died in Rome. We don't have details. Again, the history keeping back then was not the way we think of as history. The same thing is true of Paul. That's why we don't know that Paul, you know, if Paul actually did remain in prison and was executed when he first went there, or if he did what he planned to do and what traditions. Again, there are traditions, there are, there are writings from those times who said, yeah, Paul came to, came to Spain. You know, there's strong traditions of that. So, the idea that unless we dug up a stone and said, I, Peter, am here now, that it can't be true, well, we, have, we don't know. I mean, and we have to be prepared to say we don't have any rock solid, so to speak, evidence of that. But we have very, very strong traditions of people who lived within a hundred years, for instance, of that time, that he did. And you know what? That's as good as almost any history has. And most, there are not a lot of historians that challenge that. There's always outliers of historians and, you know, and people who study theology who have their own theories. Why? Because publish or perish. How do you get published? You don't get published by saying the same thing that people have been saying for 2,000 years. You get published by saying something nobody has said before, maybe because Nobody thought of it, or maybe because nobody had the nerve to say something so outrageous before. And that's just part of the way it works. Other questions? Okay, if you want to come up and look at that, in case you're wondering where your tradition lies on this map, I thought you might be interested, that's why I stuck it up there. Yes, Wendy. Uh, the Coptic Church, uh, the ancient Coptic Church, like in Ethiopia, the Ethiopian Coptic, um, the, the Coptic Church overall has been seen as part of Orthodox because it was in the East, all right? And there is, there is a, a Orthodox Coptic Churches, there's actually a group called that. Some of the most ancient of the Coptic Churches, for instance, Ethiopian Coptic, Egyptian Coptic, began as some of the earliest churches there were. It's believed, for instance, that Mark, uh, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, who was John Mark who traveled with Paul and later with Peter, that he went to Egypt and he started the Egyptian Coptic Church. In terms of like the Ethiopian Coptic Church, they, there was a, we know for a fact that there's a large population of Jews that were Ethiopian Jews. In fact, a number of years ago, the nation of Israel had this airlift of phalangist Jews from Ethiopia, and this was under the Marxist regime, and then Marxism was still rolling, to Israel. Well, there was a very early Ethiopian church, which is believed were Jews, and they, and they think that was because of the Queen of Sheba. Queen of Sheba, who left Solomon, right, and they believe may have carried his child, came back down, and there's an argument, was she from Yemeni, was she from Yemen, was she Omani, was she Ethiopian, the strongest tradition seems to say Ethiopian, 
that she brought Judaism to that part of North, Northeast Africa, and that from that, some of those Jews later converted to Christianity, believing that Jesus was the Messiah they were looking for. And so the earliest, one of the earliest churches we have is in that part of the world in terms of the Coptics. Okay? So it's, but it, it gets very complicated. And also, when I give you the three big groups, those are just the big groups. There are offshoots of that that don't fit as well. Um, but some of the Coptic churches consider themselves a branch of, like, um, Oriental Orthodoxy. Any other questions? Thank you very much.